So let me begin with a very quick overview of trace dynamics. One starts with an operator Hamiltonian, which I'll assume is a polynomial in co coordinates and momenta, which don't have any a priori commutativity properties. So the way one handles that is you form the trace. I'll use a wiggly underline for a trace quantity. So it's the trace of H of QRPR. And I'll assume that all the variables are trace class, so they can be cyclically permuted inside the trace. And then for any trace functional A of Q and RPR, here I omitted the wiggly underline, but it should be there. You define variation A by simply varying every term in A and cyclically permuting the, vari the variation to the right. That defines a derivative of a trace quantity A with respect to QR, that's the coefficient of delta QR, and the derivative of A with respect to PR times delta PR. So for any polynomial, when you take the trace, you can form a derivative of the trace with respect to the variable, even though if you try to differentiate the polynomial before you're taking the trace, the variations are stuck inside because things don't commute. So if you now start from a trace Hamiltonian and do this, I'll omit the Lagrangian step. What you find is that you get a symplectic dynamics on operator phase space. <clears throat> the H by dQr is minus P dot R, and the H by, <clears throat> excuse me, dPr is epsilon sub R Q dot R, where epsilon sub R is one for bosons and minus one for fermions. So you immediately go this way without canonical quantization to a set of operator equations. That's why I got interested in trace dynamics, because it's a way of bypassing canonical quantization. You don't have to start from a classical theory and, quote, quantize it. You go directly to an operator set of equations of motion. Then the problem is to get the restrictions of the Heisenberg algebra of quantum mechanics back. And the way you do that is through statistical mechanics. H, the trace Hamiltonian, is clearly a constant of motion. This is familiar to anyone who's looked at um, matrix models. But it turns out that if the Hamiltonian has a global unitary invariance, then there's a conserved another charge, which has a very interesting structure. It's a sum over the boson degrees of freedom of the commutator of QR with PR for the bosons, minus the sum over the fermion degrees of freedom of the anti-commutator of QR with PR for the fermions. And this looks very much like canonical commutation or anti-commutation relations. So the idea now is to try to equipartition this by doing statistical mechanics, and thereby recovering at an average level the canonical commutation, anti-commutation relations. Now it turns out you can show with a bit of work that the mu, the integration measure on operator phase space, is also a conserved quantity. So you have a Liouville theorem, and that allows you to do statistical mechanics. You can form a canonical ensemble, d mu rho, as d mu times the exponential, e to the minus trace, a <clears throat> lambda tilde, which is anti-self-adjoint, because c tilde is anti-self-adjoint, minus some number times h. So you have a lot of generalized temperatures up here in the exponent over a normalizing denominator. And now what you do is form averages of rho, and you find that with some approximations, this is, uh, which I, I still a matter to really justify them, that the averages of rho look like quantum mechanics, with the average of C tilde behaving like a constant, which I'll call Planck's constant, times an effective imaginary unit whose square root is minus one, an average of the x dot for any uh, q or p behaves in, x, within the in, inside averages, x dot behaves like I effective over h bar, commutation, commutator of an effective Hamiltonian with x effective, and the q's and p's similarly effective obey a canonical commutation relations for I effective h slash delta uv for bosons, and similarly for fermions, you get an anti-commutation relation. I'm being very fast because this is what I talked about basically at length in my keynote address two years ago, and it's all in a Cambridge University book that I wrote called Quantum Mechanic, Quantum Theory as an Emergent Phenomenon. So the idea is, then is, is that you get quantum field theory as a thermodynamics or trace dynamics, and I also suggest in the book that the fluctuation corrections to the thermodynamics, the Brownian motion, give reduction, the reduction postulate. 
Okay, what I want to do now is to go on to something that I didn't try until I was invited to talk again at this conference, which was to include gravitation. So now most of the talk is about including gravitation. So I'm going to begin with arguments for the metric g mu nu being a C number and not an operator. See, that's what you have to decide. The pre-quantum variables that are going to end up being quantized are all introduced as non-commuting operators. Then the question is, is the metric an operator or not? And I'll give a bunch of arguments that the metric has to be introduced in this framework as a C number, meaning a diagonal matrix, not a matrix with non-commuting structure. First, let's look at the invariant volume. To form invariant Lagrangians in general relativity, you need a, a volume element that's invariant under general coordinate transformations. And it has a form dv is d4x times the square root of the four-dimensional minus the four-dimensional determinant of the metric. And this guarantees that under a coordinate transformation, x mu to x mu of some other variables, x prime, what you need is a product property of the determinant to get 4g to the 1 half goes to 4g prime to the 1 half times the Jacobian, where the Jacobian times d4x is equal to d4x prime. And this will guarantee that dv is equal to dv prime, and you have an invariant volume element. Now, the problem is that if you make the metric g mu a general non-commuting operator, the product property fails. It's easy to see that the determinant of an operator matrix times a C number matrix is not equal in general to the determinant of the operator times the determinant of the C number, even if you adopt some kind of a prescription for defining the determinant of an operator, like always multiplying row elements by column elements. You have to even build in a prescription. So this already suggests that you better make the metric a C number or you're not going to get an invariant volume element. Another argument, in a couple of papers I showed that all the rigid supersymmetry theories have natural extensions to trace dynamics theories, where you don't have to assume that the fields are Grassmann or number variables or Grassmann variables. You only have to assume that the supersymmetry parameter is a commutative Grassmann variable the epsilon, that's your supersymmetry parameter. And the fields can be perfectly general, because it turns out the cyclic property under the trace gives you enough identities to show supersymmetry. But this also breaks down if the mu nu is an operator, because then the cyclic property fails. You can't permute things through all the mu nus that are used to form covariant derivatives. So this is a second argument that mu nu had better be a scalar, be, be a C number. The third is. We found no super, I, in looking, I, there's no super gravity extension with operator g mu nu and Marita Schwinger psi nu that are operators. Unlike the rigid supersymmetry theories, which can be given a trace dynamic extension, super gravity cannot be. So that again suggests that these two things, g mu nu and its partner in super gravity, the Marita Schwinger spinner psi nu, have to be C numbers. A related question is, should gravity be quantized? Dyson has written a paper for its Poincaré lecture giving very interesting arguments, saying that there isn't any Bohr-Rosenfeld analog for gravity, basically because you can't neutralize gravity the way you neutralize charges in the Bohr-Rosenfeld argument. And it's very hard to formulate an experiment to detect a single graviton. It may, in fact, be impossible to formulate an experiment to, to detect a single graviton. So these arguments also suggest that gravity, perhaps, should be outside the standard quantum theory framework. And then finally, there's some papers, older papers, of Page, Page and Gailkar and Epley and Hanna, who show that there are problems with the old uh, recipe, g mu nu, the semi-classical gravity recipe, g mu nu is minus a pi g, expectation of the operator tensor t mu nu. This, when measurements are made, basically the Bianchi identities fail because psi starts changing discontinuously under the reduction postulate, and then you don't have the Bianchi identity, which requires covariant conservation of the right-hand side to give covariant conservation of the left-hand side. So they argue that, well, you can't have classical gravity because the semi-classical recipe fails. But as Page and Gaukar point out, more complicated forms of classical gravity theories are still possible, and that's what I want to discuss now.
So let's now try and incorporate classical gravity into trace dynamics. So I'll begin with the matter action. This is a trace action now. It's a functional of the metric, g. g. Here I have an operator Lagrangian formed using the metric, which is now a C number. It's used to form covariant derivatives in the usual way. I take the trace, and then I multiply by the invariant volume element and integrate. Let me now make a total trace action as the matter action plus the gravitational one. Since the metric and the curvature scalar are C numbers, the trace just brings out a factor trace one, which is the dimension of the underlying Hilbert space for all my operators. And so SG has the usual form trace one now times integral of the invariant volume times R over 16 pi G. I'll start now divide out by trace one, so I don't have to include the wiggly underline. So I'm now talking about intensive quantities rather than things that are extensive over operator Hilbert space. So I'll write SG is the curly, the boldface SG over trace one, and S matter is the boldface S matter over trace one. The gravitational field equations will now take the form g mu nu, the Einstein tensor, plus 8 pi g, t mu nu is 0, where t mu nu is the trace stress energy tensor divided by trace 1. And now this is completely consistent with the Bianchi identities, because it's easy to show if you start with a Lorentz covariant theory and use the usual minimal recipe to form covariant derivatives, that the trace stress energy tensor is covariantly conserved. Dividing by trace one makes no difference. So you have divergence of t mu nu is zero, and that's consistent with the Bianchi identity's divergence of g mu nu is zero. So this way you can couple the classical metric to general operator pre-quantum fields and be consistent with the Bianchi identities. So if trace dynamics, this is my conjecture, implies both quantum theory and state vector reduction, then you have a consistent framework for classical gravity. The Bianchi identities will be maintained through measurements because this equation is completely general. OK, now the next thing when that's natural to look at is to say, what is the matter-induced effective action for g mu nu? The average pre-quantum matter motions can influence gravitational dynamics. Let's take the matter action, I'll take its trace, and I'll average over the canonical ensemble and divide again by trace one. So I'll form now a functional of the metric that's induced by the motion, average motions of the pre-quantum matter fields. Here by L average, I mean the integral over the canonical ensemble of L. Now it's important in doing this that you can show that rho is time independent. And the reason it is, first of all, the conserved operator C tilde is, in fact, in Lorentz invariant theories, the invariant volume element integral of the time component of a contravariant vector that's a covariantly conserved vector. So by the usual arguments, this implies that C tilde is time invariant. You pull the d mu outside the square root of g as a partial mu, and then you integrate by parts, and you find time independence. For the Hamiltonian term, the trace Hamiltonian term in the canonical ensemble, it's a little more complicated. If you take t naught naught, the lower 0, upper 0, times square root of 4g, I'll, that is, in fact, uh, an interesting quantity. If you add the Einstein-Dirac pseudotensor, that's a pseudo tensor, it's not a true tensor, constructed so that the ordinary divergence of the square root of 4g times t mu nu plus trace 1 little t mu nu is 0. This allows you, again, by the usual integration by parts argument to show that the trace Hamiltonian is time independent. Now, it turns out that this t mu nu actually drops out of all the canonical ensemble averages between numerator and denominator. So you don't have to know, use its detailed structure although it has some rather interesting properties that I discuss in my paper. OK, so we can form an effective action because rho, in fact, the canonical ensemble is time independent. Uh, 
Now let's talk about constraints on the form of the effective action. C tilde, as I discussed, is a Lorentz scalar, but H, the canonical, the trace Hamiltonian, is a time component of a four vector. So therefore, the canonical ensemble picks out a preferred frame, which is natural to, uh, to identify with the rest frame of the cosmological background radiation. The old Einstein argument, you know, no longer applies. Einstein said, well, if you have an elevator and you drill a little hole, you can't tell what your Lorentz frame you're in. But now we know you can. You just put a radiometer looking out the hole and look for the dipole in the cos CMB. And you can tell what your absolute motion is. And then all the studies of CMB just take that dipole out when they discuss higher moments. So in fact, we can tell what our, prefer what our Lorentz frame of motion is relative to the absolute frame defined by the CMB radiation. OK, it's easy to see that rho is invariant under purely spatial general coordinate transformation. Since I've restricted myself now to a preferred frame, the CMB rest frame, I cannot make time-dependent coordinate transformations. But I can make transformations that just mix up the functionally changed the spatial variables. So that means the effective action is also invariant under purely spatial general coordinate transformations. So I have to look now at the, how the metric behaves. G naught naught is a three space scalar. G naught I is a three space covariant vector. And if I take the quotient 4G over 3G, this is the three dimensional determinant, and write it as G naught naught plus G naught I DI. DI is a three space, three space contravariant vector. So the leading order effective interaction in expansion and powers of derivatives of the metric has a form delta SG, the induced action, is the integral over the invariant volume element of some function, a general function of its four arguments of G naught naught, that's a rotational a three space scalar, G naught I, G naught J, G super I J, D I, D J, G sub I J, and G naught I, D I. And this is as far as you get using just three space general coordinate transformations. But now let's use something else. Let's use while scaling invariance. There's a very nice paper by Forger and Rumer. I'll give the reference later in Annals of Physics, analyzing in great detail the implications of while scaling invariance for classical field theory. Under a global while transformation, the metric transforms as g mu nu goes to lambda squared g mu nu. Notice that I'm not rescaling the point x. You're staying at the same space-time point, but rescaling all of your fields by different factors. g super mu scales with lambda to the minus 2. The Feuerbein e mu a scales with lambda. And here, when I raise the g covariant index up, it scales with lambda inverse. Now let's look at the matter fields where Q of x is a field and P of x is its corresponding canonical momentum. Then Forger and Rumer show that Q of x goes to lambda to some power minus WQ Q of x, and P of x goes to lambda minus WP P of x, according to this table. In n dimensions for a scalar field, WQ is a half n minus 2, and WP is WQ plus 2. So in four dimensions, the scaling dimensions are one for the coordinate scalar field and three for its canonical momentum. For Dirac spinner, the corresponding dimensions are a half n minus one and wq plus one, or it's three halves and five halves. And for yang mills field, it's zero. And it has to be zero because of the nonlinearity. The yang mills field strength is partial a plus a cross a, and the partial a and a cross a terms can have the same scaling only if the while scaling is zero. And that only works in four dimensions. So this now is starting to restrict when I talk about yang mills fields to purely four dimensions, not 10 or 26 dimensions. Well, then you can show that the massless spin zero action, the massless Dirac spinner action, and the yang mills action are all globally while invariant off shell in four dimensions. And in fact, there are some further statements that I, are in the, my paper about local vial invariance. There's, there's, uh, but that's not needed for what I'm going to say here. Now, remarkably, you can also show 
that if you multiply by the square root of 4g, t sub mu super nu is globally wild invariant off shell, and square root of 4g c tilde, the conserved operator, is wild invariant off shell. By off shell, I mean that in all these statements, I'm not using the equations of motion. The main analysis of the Forger rumor paper was to see when the trace of the energy momentum tensor is vile invariant. And then you have to use the equations of motion. So they have some theorems about on shell, vile invariance implies T sub mu super mu equals zero. But here I'm just looking at the scale invariance and not taking the trace. And then I can make off shell statements. And that's important because in the canonical ensemble, I'm integrating over all of operator space. I'm not restricting myself to the subspace of operator space that satisfies the equations of motion. So it's important that I have an off-shell violent variance. The scaling factor lambda just cancels between the d mu in the numerator and the d mu in the denominator. So we can conclude then that the effective action delta SG is violent variant. And that means that all these lambda factors have to cancel out. So the general form that's left is the invariant volume element, but this brings in a lambda squared, so you have to cancel it by putting, putting a g naught naught to the minus 2 in, dividing by g naught naught squared. And then a function of g naught i, g naught j, g i j over g naught naught, <coughs> d i, d j, g i j over g naught naught, and g naught i, d i over g naught naught. And this is the most general form where this is now a function of its three arguments. OK, so we immediately see that a standard cosmological constant term, integral d4x square root of 4g, is excluded by Weyl invariance. What we see is that when the metric is diagonal, when there's no zero i component of the metric, this whole thing simplifies to delta sg is a constant times the invariant volume element times g naught naught to the minus 2. So this is the effective action that replaces the standard cosmological constant action. But we'll get a cosmological constant back in a minute. OK, first though, <clears throat> let me discuss the rules for using the frame-dependent action. I'll write S total. The total is a gravitational part plus this induced part coming from the pre-quantum matter motions, plus then usual particulate matter contributions. This part is frame dependent. Remember I said it's really only defined in the first instance. You can transform it out of the cosmological background rest frame, but it's defined and it picks out a preferred frame. Therefore, I can't use the usual arguments to vary with respect to all components of the metric to get my field equations. I can only vary with respect to the spatial components. So I get as my field equations gij plus 8 pi g delta t i j plus delta t particulate matter, but t particulate matter i j equals 0, where the delta t here is just the usual variation of the induced gravitational action. So you don't, by varying the effective action, <clears throat> get the 0 i and 0 0 components of the Einstein equations, you have to generate those by using the Bianchi identities. And on the right-hand side, you have to put a conserving extension of the Tij, of the delta Tij, that obeys covariant conservation. So it's a little tr tricky getting the equations in motion. You really only directly get the ones for Gij. But that's enough in most instances, in fact, to solve for what's going on, as I'll show in a couple of interesting cases. OK, so let's now apply this formalism to the Robertson-Walker cosmology, where ds squared <coughs> is dt squared minus a squared of t, your expansion factor, times dr squared over 1 minus kr squared, where k gives you your curvature of 1, 0, or minus 1, plus r squared times the angular factor. Well, here g naught naught is 1. So the effective action is a naught times integral d4x square root of 4g, which looks just like a cosmological constant. And the delta tij is just minus a naught gij, and the conserving extension is obviously, obviously delta t mu nu is minus a naught g mu nu, because g mu nu by itself satisfies the covariant, covariant conservation condition. So this says that if there's no bare cosmological constant, 
The so-called dark energy in this interpretation is the energy associated with motions of the pre-quantum matter fields. And if I make that identification, if I say, well, this term is in fact the dark energy, then that fixes a naught to be minus lambda over 8 pi g, where lambda is the observed cosmological constant. Now, I'm not claiming to have an argument that the cosmological constant is very small. That will have to come out of details in the underlying dynamics. What I'm saying is simply I get from this an explanation of why there should be a non-zero cosmological constant, and then I can relate this unknown constant in the effective action to that measured cosmological constant and try and do some phenomenology with it. Okay, let's now apply this to the static spherically symmetric metric, which is bas basically the only cases in general relativity where you have neat solutions are the cosmological metric and the various black hole metrics. So here, ds squared in the non-rotating non case is b of r dt squared minus a of r dr squared minus r squared times the angular factor. Here, g naught naught is not one, it's b of r, so the induced action now is minus lambda over 8 pi g. I'll use the identification of A naught with lambda over 8, minus lambda over 8 pi g, times the invariant volume, volume element times B of R to the minus 2. Taking spatial variations, you get equations of motion. Delta T i j is lambda over 8 pi g, g i g over B squared. Delta T sub i j is lambda over 8 pi g g sub i g over b squared. And so you get modified Einstein equations. GRR is my equal minus lambda a of r over b of r squared is 0. And g theta theta minus lambda r squared over b of r squared is 0. If you didn't have the b of r squared factors here, denominators here, then this would just be the set of equations for the Einstein, de Sitter, the Schwarzschild de Sitter solution which is exactly soluble, and you know what it is. It's the 1 minus 2m over r minus a third lambda r squared. But the b of r squared is obviously going to change things very dramatically near the horizon. Well, first let me address, you can easily find the conserving extension here. The Bianchi identity is this, grr prime, that's d by dr of grr, minus 2a over r cubed g theta theta, plus b prime over 2b plus 2 over r minus a prime over a grr plus a b prime over 2b squared gtt mm -hmm. equals zero. So this is now just an algebraic equation for gtt. If you substitute the previous expressions, you, what you find is that the modif equation, modified equation for gtt is gtt is mi minus 3 lambda over b is equal to zero. And this system of equations can now be reduced to a one-dimensional differential equation for, one, for the function b. If I define x as square root of lambda times r, so I rescale out the square root of lambda, then I can solve algebraically for a of x, it's b squared plus x b b prime over b squared minus x squared, and you get this master equation for b, b second plus 2 over x b prime, where that means d by dr squared, this is d by dr, plus 2 xb prime plus b, xb prime plus 3b over b, b squared minus x squared equals 0. And then you can start to study this equation. All right, well, this is a sketch. It's now been basically verified by some calculations that Fethi Ramazanoglu, a Princeton postdoc I'm working with, has done. Uh, if I write little b as b of x, just from looking at the differential equation, you can get a lot of information about it. And what you find is that b can never be 0. So there isn't a true horizon. b goes down to some minimum where there's a square root branch point, but which we've now found to be a coordinate singularity. And whereas d by dr at a square root is 1 over a square root and blows up, d by ds, where s is the proper distance, is in fact finite to all orders. So this is a coordinate singularity. The metric B becomes complex inside that radius and is real outside. This is the Schwarzschild reason where the behavior is 1 minus 2m over r to a good approximation. And then at very large cosmological distances, there's a problem. B falls off as x to the minus 6. And so you find that there's a large x curvature singularity and we're trying to figure out now whether that's an artifact of making a static approximation of neglecting time dependence, which 
leads us into a, some more complicated equations. Uh, one interesting thing that emerged, which is kind of hidden in the equations, is that the curvature scalar is identically zero for that differential equation. It's a bit of work to prove it. Uh, first, we found it just by doing Taylor expansions around the square root, and then we found uh, we could prove it from the equation. So there's a lot of hidden structure within that equation. Okay, well, that's where things stand now. What we're doing is looking at time-dependent extensions. That gets complicated for the following reason. The effective action I gave was to leading orders in derivatives. As soon as you allow time derivatives of g naught naught, you can multiply by any function of the time derivative of g naught naught over g naught naught, because that's a vile scalar invariant. So you don't have a unique effective action anymore. What we're doing is looking at the original effective action in with an ansatz that there's an old paper of McVitie looking at embedding a, a particular embedding of a black hole in the cosmology. And there's a certain ansatz where you say that the variable is r e to the h t. And then you can, in that, with that ansatz, you can get a one-dimensional differential equation rather than a partial differential equation. So what we're going to do is to study in that ansatz what time dependence does. I don't think we're going to go on to the partial differential equation be case before we write this up. So that's finished. That's the current status of this. So I'll give some references. The effective action arguments are described in this paper. Uh, this paper on the archive gives a preliminary analysis of the static spherically symmetric case. And then in work with Fethi Ramosanoglu, there'll be uh, numerical stuff and a bit more analysis, like the fact that r is 0. Let me also give the reference to the forger rumor paper, a very beautiful paper, paper in Annals of Physics, who did the great service of giving a very detailed analysis of vial scaling in classical field theory. Thank you. OK, we thank Professor Radler for this extremely stimulating talk in which fundamental problems like the existence of a preferred reference frame or the necessity of quantizing gravity have been raised. And now I open the discussion. Yeah, Berg. Please. Just a simple uh, question. I think, as you know, at, uh, a at the classical level, right, the uh, Bianchi identity is certified on the left side and the right side, the team you knew, semicolon nu. Uh, um, now, I have a comment about the page paper wherein you said the semi-classical gravity yes. doesn't satisfy the uh, Bianchi identity. I, I think that paper was in the 80s, right? It's Things, an old paper, yeah. It's an old one, actually, that's been transcended, yeah. The semi-classical gravity has its own problems, which can be fixed by adding a fluctuation term in it. Uh, but, but we could talk about that one. My question to you was, um, did you say that at, even at the classical level, uh, the Einstein equation has a problem? That's what prompted you to add, sort of divide it by the trace? I don't understand. No, no. The Page and Galcar's argument is that the semi-classical gravity is OK until you have put in state vector reduction when psi changes discontinuously. I, do the fluctuation terms actually fix that up? Right. The, uh, that was proven by uh, myself and Enrique. Um, OK, yeah, that's, in, that's interesting. So now there's a complete theory. Yeah, but the reason, my main reason here for making G classical is to have the invariant volume element have the right behavior. I just don't see any yep. way of getting that without having G be, be a classical degree uh -huh. of freedom. But that was sort of known, right, to, to people. I, I was just wondering. Well, no, in quantum field theory, it's not a problem. Because in quantum field theory, G becomes an operator. Mm -hmm. But it's not a canonical momentum, it's just a canonical coordinate. So it commutes with itself, all components commute. So you don't have that problem. But here in the pure pre-quantum dynamics, I'm making all the canonical coordinates be non-commuting. And so okay. that's why I have a problem if I make G uh, an operator. Which we don't usually see if we look at well, quantum field theory. We don't usually see when yeah, you quantize okay. gravity because G mu nu is the coordinate, it's not the pi mu nu, which is conjugate. Speak as well, thank you. Okay. Are there other questions? Oh. Well, uh, I think I should ask the question then for both. <laughs> How unique is the construction of semi-classical gravity? I have, uh, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it does, it does seem that you, you have impl 
yeah, chosen I one path of implementation. I, and, I, just uh, call, I mentioned that just because that was but, one of the uh, things that Dyson referred to in his paper. As far as but I'm aware, I this is the, I think, lots of ambiguities. What I give here, I think, is unique. There's really only one way to do it because the trace stress energy tensor is covariantly conserved. And so the, the usual argument of varying with these with respect to the metric uniquely gives you the Einstein equation I wrote down. So here it's unique. I'm not much interested in semi-classical gravity, and if it's been fixed up, that's fine, but that's not what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Thomas. I have a question I think is maybe partly contained what uh, Belog asked. Um, could you address, in, in this framework, could you address ideas like the Diozzi penrose collapse Proposals. I mean, it seems well, should yeah, be Yeah, I have there. a comment there, and that is all the objective collapse models require that the noise be coupled in a non-hermitian way. Uh, well, Dioshi will be talking later, but I believe that in Dioshi Penrose collapse, and for it to work, the noise has to go into an imaginary part of the metric. You know, the idea is, as I said that yesterday, there could be a small, very rapidly fluctuating imaginary part of the metric. The metric can be complex because if the source term, say from the sun, is real, the Laplacian of a real plus imaginary, only the real part gets excited. So all astronomy tells us is that the real part gets large excitations, and there could still be a complex imaginary part that's very small. And I think if you want to do state vector reduction models, you'll have to do that. The reason is that there's a, the one a, a significant experimental constraint so far is that the coupling to the noise has to be mass proportional. And the most natural way of getting a mass proportional noise is to have it coupled to the gravitational potential having a complex part. Now here, when I solved this Einstein equation for the spherically symmetric solution, I found that instead of horizon, I got a, a square root branch cut. And so I get, have to start thinking about complex metrics, which fits into the reasoning I'm giving here. <laughs> 